Hello everyone, Tom in Los Angeles. Today is July 18th, 2021, and I'm going to talk about uh, Canto 11 of Purgatorio, or the 45th Canto of the 100 Cantos of the Divine Comedy. So this is the 45th video out of my series of uh, 100 videos that I'm uh, doing to honor Dante uh, in the 700th um, anniversary year from his death. Let's get started with this uh, canto. Canto 11 is uh, the second one of this triptych that is dedicated to pride, to the prideful. So Dante is pushing the concept further, both of pride and humility. At the beginning of this uh, central canto, he puts an extended version of the Our Father. Uh, I'm reading from, Mandelb from Mandelbaum, and uh, I think he's doing a really, really excellent job here. From the beginning, the first line, Our Father, you who dwell within the heavens, but are not circums circumscribed by them. It's uh, Dante being careful about his theology here. Yes, God is in the heavens, but we need to remember that for the Middle Ages, God was in fact uh, in the highest heavens, all, also in a physical sense, because there were all these uh, uh, heavenly spheres that were surrounding the earth. Um, so he's saying, yes, God is there, but not because he's there and not elsewhere. He is everywhere, but he's got a um, particular, a greater love for his first works above. That's why physically he can be found there. It's a, a little bit of a theological, astronomical uh, stretch that Dante is doing here. In this canto, we are still in the first terrace, the terrace of the prideful, and uh, Dante is uh, investigating the sum of the prideful souls. We're going to find three specific characters, historic characters, who lived more or less in Dante's times, if not a little bit before. We already saw how uh, Dante was, um, um, in fact, as a member of the laity, uh, probably part of the Franciscan order, at least as a oblate or somebody who was helping a Franciscan uh, group in, in Florence. He had been close to the Franciscans, and uh, this is uh, uh, pretty clear throughout the Divine Comedy. He feels close to St. Francis and to the Franciscans. One little spy of this, one sign of this, can be found uh, already in line four, where uh, in this Our Father, Dante says, uh, uh, praised be your name and your omnipotence by every creature. Uh, I'm not sure about the other translations, but this particular English translation doesn't immediately recall St. Francis the way that the Italian does. Because in Italian, Dante says, laudato sia il tuo nome e il tuo valore. And this laudato sia, literally is taken from the canticle of the creatures that St. Francis wrote and as a liturgical poem. Something that took me a long time to notice is that uh, there is a correspondence between the very powerful first line of the Our Father as a prayer uh, that Dante takes um, almost literally here and the first line of the Divine Comedy. In particular, in this uh, Our, Our Father, uh, as a, it can be a very personal prayer, but it starts with our, opening up to the collective, to the plural. And uh, the same thing uh, does the first line of the Divine Comedy. In the middle of the journey of our life, Dante could have easily said of my life, but he says our. And there is a religious, a spiritual meaning behind that. There is this uh, opening to the uh, Christian communion, opening to the collective of all people on earth, all children of God, basically. So this beautiful and long prayer is recited by um, this group of souls. It's, uh, we don't know exactly by whom in the specific, but these are the souls who are the prideful. And uh, we need to imagine these rocks that they are carrying on their backs as really massive, because some of them are so hunched underneath these uh, rocks that Dante and Virgil cannot even see their faces, their heads. So. Of course, it's a metaphorical image, but uh, that's how we should properly visualize these this prideful souls. On line 25, we can find some, a word that 
In fact, some commentators have defined the most mysterious word in the Divine Comedy. Uh, mysterious because it's been very difficult, if not impossible, to understand where Dante took it from and even what it actually means. This word is Ramonia, which uh, Mandelbaum translates as uh, good penitence. The line is line 25, Così a se e noi buona Ramonia, quell'ombre orando. Mandelbaum has always does a really good job here in translating. He says, beseeching thus good penitence for us and for themselves, those shades moved on beneath their weights, like those we sometimes bear in dreams. It's a simple sentence in terms of the meaning, and uh, he translates Ramonia in uh, good penitence. But uh, some other translators and commentators have translated as uh, this Ramonia as uh, a safe heaven, so beseeching safe heaven for us, or uh, a furtherance, uh, or uh, some sort of penitence as well. So I'm curious what your translation is saying about this uh, word because for modern Italians Romagna doesn't really say doesn't mean anything and uh, it's possible to connect it with some old uh, French term or uh, dialect in, in Italy but uh, no one seems to be sure of what the heck it means. It's interesting how um, on line 37 um, where, that, where Virgil starts to speak and uh, he says uh, ah so may justice and compassion soon unburden you on the Italian side, um, he says, De, se giustizia e pietà vi disgrievi tosto. This uh, giustizia e pietà, as a pair of terms, is found actually only another time. And uh, it's only in Canto 10, where, uh, if you remember the visible speech, within this visible speech between Trajan and the old widow, there was this uh, mention of giustizia e pietà, justice and mercy. Uh, in this case, justice and compassion is a, is a good translation as well. The question is, why is Virgil using exactly these two words? Um, what is Dante doing here? Why did he use, did he want, why did he want to refer to that particular pair of terms? And uh, this would open up some good reflections, useful reflections. There's no real answer and uh, um, nobody has come up with uh, a really properly convincing theory, but it's, a, it's an interesting point. Virgil's message is pretty blunt. He asks the souls, uh, where is the shortest passage to get to the next terrace from here? And let's remember that uh, this relationship between Virgil and Dante, yes, Dante is made of flesh, and the souls, they, these souls are actually suffering. It could be almost seen as a rude question to ask uh, how to go and uh, go up and have a little uh, light walk, the lightest possible walk, to somebody who is uh, carrying a massive boulder on, on, on their shoulder. So at this point, uh, the way the souls reply is uh, very gentle, very um, kind. The person who is speaking cannot even turn his head up to look because his boulder is so massive and heavy. But, uh, and he expresses this, he says, I would like to look at you, uh, person in the flesh, because I'm curious to see who you are. I was Italian, son of a great Tuscan. And uh, let's remember, Dante tends to use the word Latino or Latin for Italian. Uh, Nato d'un gran Tosco. My father basically was a great man in Tuscany. And my father was Guglielmo Aldo Brandesco. The person who is speaking here is Umberto, Umberto Aldobrandesco. He was part of a powerful Ghibelline family. And uh, he talks about uh, ancient blood and splendid deeds. So he is incarnating here as an example of family pride. He's a perfect example of pridefulness and pride coming from uh, either nobility or in any case, what your, the, the high standing of your family has given you. Umberto lived uh, earlier than Dante. He was, in fact, uh, part of this powerful family, and he was murdered by the Guelphs from Siena in uh, 1256, just outside his castle. That's how he found his death. Interesting how he refers to his own life and his own uh, history, saying, 
I scorned all men past measure, and that scorn brought me my death. The CNAs know how, because that's who murdered him. Uh, the CNAs know how, as does each child in Campagnatico. Um, there is a little bit of uh, controversy about this translation, each child, and maybe in your translation you might have something different, because what uh, Dante uses at line 66 is ogni fante, ogni fante. Um, infante means infant and child, and so that's why possibly child is the correct translation. However, uh, other translators have been using uh, this ogni fante with the meaning of uh, every man, any type of man, or even as every infantry man, everybody, every soldier. So it could be translated that way, and we don't know exactly which one of these meanings Dante um, had in mind. The explanation that Umberto gives um, about his uh, sin and his punishment here is really valid for everybody around him. It's very clear, and uh, he gives it almost as a presentation of the people on this terrace. Now, at this point, we have the second soul, um, line 74. One of these souls twisted himself beneath the weight that burned them, and uh, he saw and knew me and called out to me, fixing his eyes on me laboriously. Let's notice this uh, difference between Umberto and this other soul, who we know is going to be Oderisi. Umberto couldn't even twist his uh, head and side to look up to Dante because of how heavy his, burden, his boulder was. Oderisi actually can look up. So there is a, a uh, gradual difference in the weight that these souls are, are carrying. And obviously Oderisi is considered by Dante to have a slightly lighter weight to, to carry with himself. Oderisi from Gubbio. Gubbio is a beautiful medieval town in uh, Umbria. Everyone should go and visit it. He was a famous uh, miniaturist, so he, uh, he was a, a great um, illuminator of manuscripts. And uh, illuminated manuscripts are uh, a little bit of a passion of mine. I could lose my entire life just uh, studying and researching and enjoying um, illuminated manuscripts because they are really, some of them, they are incredibly beautiful and gorgeous. And maybe I'll, I'll have a chance to show a couple here in this video. Maybe a couple from Odorizzi himself, if I, if I can find them online. Um, in any case, he died in 1299. So he was a little bit uh, closer to Dante's uh, lifetime than Umberto. And we can see immediately the difference here in uh, what each soul is exemplifying. Umberto was exemplifying the family pride. Oderisi is exemplifying the pride for his accomplishments, pride for his uh, success or material success. Even more interesting, we have here uh, line 78, where Dante is telling us, I completely hunched, walked on with them. I've, uh, I've always thought about this uh, a lot. The fact that uh, in Inferno, it was uh, uh, easier to understand where Dante felt a deeper empathy and, and uh, uh, compassion, but uh, self-reflection uh, in some souls in Inferno by fainting or uh, just suffering together with the souls. Here in Purgatorio, he tends to participate in the punitive exercise that these souls are going through. And so he's uh, empathizing more, in particular in Purgatorio, with souls uh, on the terraces of pride, of wrath and lust. We're going to see this uh, because as a admission that uh, he knew about himself, that these were the sins that he was guilty of. Now, because Oderisi was so accomplished and so successful, really one of the best artists in his field, the, the next, uh, let's call it 40 verses, are all about uh, artistic achievement. And uh, I really love them because uh, it's, uh, it's where Dante gets so universal. The page is painted by the brush of Franco Bolognese, who was uh, his pupil. He was Oderisi's pupil in the same art of uh, illumination, illuminating manuscripts. Uh, smile more brightly. All the glory now is his. Mine but apart. He's already comparing the glory 
of uh, his pupil to his. And uh, somebody says that Franco Bolognese was in fact objectively better than Odorizzi, but I'm not an expert, I really don't know. I really love the way uh, Odorizzi describes Purgatorio from his eyes, which is um, lo gran disio dell'eccellenza, or in other words, uh, the great desire for eminence which drove my heart. Uh, for such pride, here one pays the penalty. This uh, eccellenza is the desire of being out, out of the group of the normal people, to be better, to be superior. That's the essence, the essence of pride. But Odorizzi has been saved, he says here, because while I still could sin, while he was still alive, I turned to him, I turned to God. And here is another one of those uh, really famous, really popular tercets from the Divine Comedy that goes, O empty glory of the powers of humans, how briefly green endures upon the peak, unless an age of dullness follows it. I think the meaning of this is fairly clear, but uh, it's not completely clear what, the, what this peak is, the peak of what. Uh, we can think of it as the peak of an artist accomplishment, so Odorizzi reached the peak of his uh, career as a miniaturist, and that would make sense. Uh, but, at the same time, somebody talked about uh, this peak as uh, the forehead, because Dante uses it in this particular meaning in Purgatorio 15, as we will see. So, in that case, if this peak, uh, the, the word in Italian, of course, is cima, Shima could mean peak of a mountain, but also the top of somebody's head and therefore forehead. If Shima means a forehead, then the green is probably referred to the laurel and not to the grass in, on top of a mountain. And, and it would make sense, especially because Dante is the one writing and as a poet he was always thinking about the glory of poets and therefore laurel. It's fairly unbelievable how bluntly and curtly Dante um, brushes over this, uh, the careers of great artists like Cimabue and Giotto here, line 94. In painting, Cimabue thought he held the field, and now it's Giotto, they acclaim. Giotto is a contemporary of Dante. Both great artists for their time, but uh, this is a perfect, another example of how a great artist has been replaced by another one, maybe even better, and uh, it's really, beautiful how so did one Guido from the other rest to the glory of our tongue and he perhaps is born who will chase both out of the nest. This is a very clever line but it's also ironic and it's also ironic that we find it in in the middle of the three cantos about pride because it's pure Dante arrogance. He's talking about uh, Guido uh, Cavalcanti and Guido Guinizelli two great poets of his time. Of course, we heard about uh, Cavalcanti already, his good friend, then gone bad. But uh, Guinizelli uh, held the highest place in the public esteem until Guido Cavalcanti took it from him. And maybe somebody even better than these two great poets has already been born in 1300. It's, uh, rem it's remembering who is writing these lines that makes us laugh with uh, a little bit of content mixed with uh, just affection for Dante. The other really famous terzina here is uh, uh, verse 100. Non è il mondan rumore, altro che un fiato di vento, cor vien quinci e or vien quindi, this uh, musicality of these lines. The mondan rumore is translated by Mandelbaum as uh, worldly renown. Uh, it's a... Uh, literal translation and a good one, but personally I found a better one in uh, Kirkpatrick, Robin Kirkpatrick, who translates these lines as uh, the roar of earthly fame. I like this roar of earthly fame mainly because it gives it a little bit of a, an emotional punch more than worldly renown, but in any case I guess it's also very subjective. Uh, it's nothing then other than a breath of wind that blows now here, now there. It changes immediately. Before a thousand years have passed, a span that is almost like an eyeblink for, an eyeblink for the universe, would you find greater glory if you left your flesh when it was old 
than if your death had come before your infant words were spent. I really like the flow of Mandelbaum's translation here. However, he is uh, glossing over something pretty important that Dante does in Italian, which is uh, he's giving us two terms that are basically baby talk for bread and money. These are pappo and dindi. Pappo would be a baby talk for bread and dindi from denari um, for, for money. So Kirkpatrick, who I've, I've noticed tends to be a little bit more uh, courageous or daring in his translation, translates this line as, uh, then if you died before you left off, lisping dindins or penth, which is interesting. It's a different way, but he at least tries to follow uh, more closely what Dante does on, on, in the original Italian. And we finally get to the third soul of the canto. He is Provenzan Salvani. Um, he's introduced by Oderisi uh, at verse 109. The man who moves so slowly on the path before me. He's moving very slowly. All Tuscany, all Tuscany acclaim his name and now his fame has uh, changed completely. They scarcely whisper of him even in Siena. Even in Siena because uh, Provenzan was a prominent Ghibelline from Siena. Very powerful man. He was a politician. In a certain period of time, he was actually almost the de facto dictator of Siena for some time. And then he changed different roles. But uh, one really important um, aspect of Provenzan's life that Dante is highlighting here is the way that he saved his soul. Not only he saved his soul by um, behaving in a certain way, but he also managed to skip a particular uh, time of penitence that is uh, planned in, in the anti-purgatorio. So what happened? Dante asks, uh, if a spirit who awaits the edge of life before repenting must stay below and not ascend here for as long a time as he had spent alive, tell me how Salvani's entry here has been allowed, because we are here in 1300 and uh, Provenzano Salvani had been dead for only a short time. What happened is that a friend of his, a friend of Provenzan, had been uh, thrown in prison, in jail, by Charles d'Anjou. And uh, he wanted to do anything he could to help him. And even being some, somebody so noble and of a high status, Provenzan, to raise the 10,000 florins that Charles d'Anjou had established as a ransom for Provenzan, or let's, let's say to bail him out, uh, he begged on a bench in the Siena Square, like a beggar, uh, and uh, for many days, until he actually collected all that money and was able to free his friend. For this particular act of humility and love for his friend, he is getting this uh, particular salvation. The canto ends uh, with a prophecy of uh, Dante's exile, as we've uh, already heard many times, where uh, Oderisi says, uh, I know I speak obscurely, but soon enough you'll find your neighbor's acts are such that what I say can be explained. You, Dante, you will feel that sense of uh, humbling and uh, that pain in begging people because literally Dante uh, had in, in, during his exile to go around and uh, ask for, even if uh, as a poet, as a, a very respected person, just let's think, you know, how prideful Dante was. For him, even to ask something was, uh, was, must have been difficult. And, and here is where this uh, other beautiful canto ends. Um, before moving on to the next one, canto 12, I want to um, show you two uh, Dante-related books. Uh, the first one is not really Dante-related, but uh, it's uh, broader and it's related to purgatory in particular. It's a history book by Jacques Le Goff, famous French historian. I know it's uh, available in English as well, so I'm gonna show the English version here. Uh, I only just started it, but uh, for anybody who is a little curious about uh, how this uh, doctrine of purgatory came together, this is a perfect uh, text to, to study and to find some interesting uh, bits. The other one is, uh, I really fell in love with this other book because it's actually a part of a 
trilogy, let's call it, because it's, a, it's following the Divine Comedy. And uh, it's, uh, this book here is called a Spiritual Direction from Dante by Paul Pearson of the Oratory. And uh, this particular uh, version here is the Ascending Mount Purgatory. Uh, it's divided by canto, so for each canto, uh, Paul Pearson of the Oratory has been uh, sharing um, real um, spiritual insight that can be gathered from uh, the Divine Comedy, from the Purgatory. For example, when it comes to Canto 11, um, this book says, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas refers to pride as the root of all sins, but this lowest place is also a reminder of the lowly status of these souls. This is something I hadn't really picked up on, for example. A lowliness they refuse to acknowledge on earth. So they are beneath almost everyone in purgatory. And this other note. We often limit our idea of pride to a sort of arrogance, assuming we are better than everyone else. That's pride, yes. But when we say that pride is the root of all sin, uh, this sort of pride does not seem to be what we mean. We are not always feeling superior when we are sinning. Many times we sin by forgetting our own proper dignity. So in this sense, uh, self-focus or self-centeredness looks at the universe um, only from our own perspective. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we feel superior, but we could also feel inferior. So anything that uh, distorts our objective image of what we are, our strengths, our weaknesses, our skills, our flaws, uh, could fall under the sin of, of uh, pride. And uh, I love this type of uh, approach, uh, a very Christian approach, of course, to the Divine Comedy. Uh, I would like to also present uh, the cover of uh, the first book of this trilogy, which is Spiritual Direction for Inferno. And I also know, I'm looking forward to it, in fact, that uh, in a few months, the third one, the spiritual direction for Paradiso, will be available as well. So I'm very happy to uh, mention these books because they are really great works. Thank you so much for watching, as always, and uh, thanks for your time. I hope this was uh, a useful 25-30 minutes with uh, Canto 11. And uh, please let me know what you thought about it. And uh, if you have a different translation, I'm always very curious about that as well. Thanks and speak soon.